Let's start talking about probability. The sample space is the set of all, all possible outcomes. Oftentimes in a Venn diagram, you'll see the sample space labeled like this. An event is a specific outcome or group of outcomes within the sample space. It's a subset of the sample space. We can describe an event in a circle, meaning that all of these items are an event within the sample space. Events are often labeled with letters such as A or B. Another way to represent the sample space would be a tree diagram, which is a series of branches showing possible outcomes. And then the final way to write out the sample space is set notation. Brackets mean a set, and then you come in and list items separated by commas. For example, list the sample space for each activity or experiment. In a car or truck engine, a greater number of cylinders generally increases engine smoothness and power. Use set notation to list the sample space for the normal number of cylinders in a car or truck engine. When we say normal, we usually think of a four-cylinder, six-cylinder, or eight-cylinder engine, although there are a few engines with three, five, ten, twelve, or even sixteen cylinders. In an inline engine, the cylinders are lined up in a single row. In a V-type engine, the two banks of cylinders lie at an angle to each other. A slant engine has only one bank of cylinder. This bank leads to one side. Cylinders of an opposed engine lie flat on either side of the crankshaft. Four-cylinder engines usually have inline slant or opposed cylinder arrangements. In an inline engine, the cylinders are lined up in a single row. In a V-type engine, the two banks of cylinders lie at an angle to each other. A slant engine has only one bank of cylinders. This bank leans to one side. Cylinders of an opposed engine lie flat on either side of the crankshaft. Four-cylinder engines usually have inline slant or opposed cylinder arrangements. Six-cylinder engines can have inline slant or V-type arrangements. Eight-cylinder engines are commonly V-type engines. Use a Venn diagram to summarize the sample space. The first thing we will do is represent the sample space with a box. Next, we will draw circles to represent the four, six, and eight-cylinder engines. Our next step will be to put the type of engine into each of the correct circles. Four-cylinder engines can have inline slant or opposed. Six-cylinder engines can have inline slant or V. Eight-cylinder engines are commonly V. Our next step is to look for items that overlap between categories. For instance, if I look at the six and the eight-cylinder engines, both of them contain a V. We will move the V into the 6 and the 8 space. Looking for other items that overlap, I see that the I and the S, the inline and the slant engine, are common to both a 4 and a 6 cylinder. We'll move those into the space representing 6 and 4. Right now, that space is a little small, so let's come in and widen it. Now that the space is a little wider, we can fit the I and the S into the category for 4 and 6 and remove it from the individual categories. This is a complete Venn diagram. The saddle shop carries barrel saddles, roping saddles, and English saddles. Each of these saddle types come with seat sizes of youth, small adult, average adult, and large adult. Use a tree diagram to represent the sample space of saddles carried at the store. Let's start by creating a set of branches for the type of saddle. Now let's create a set of branches for the saddle size. Coming off of the barrel saddles, there's youth, small adult, average adult, and large adult. Same for roping and same for English. So if you were to list the sample space, you would follow each branch. Looking at the first branch, I see that there's a barrel saddle that's a youth size. Then there's a barrel saddle that's a small adult size then a barrel that's an adult, and then a barrel that's a large. Then we move into the roping saddle, and roping saddles come in the youth. And I think you guys see the pattern, so I'm going to go ahead and fill in the rest. Make sure that you close your sample space with a set of braces, just like we opened them with a set of braces. To calculate the probability of, of an event, we denote it as P of A. A is the name of the event. It's the proportion of times the outcome would occur in a very long series of independent trials. 
or the long run proportion of times an event would occur, would occur compared to the total number of observations. If you take definition 2, you can use it to arrive at a formula. To find the probability of event A, list all possible outcomes of A. So we will call this the number in A. And that's here. It's the number of times an event would occur, the number of outcomes in A, compared to the total number of observations, the possible events in the sample space, the number in S. So this is your formula that you'll use to calculate probabilities. So for example, consider rolling a pair of die. Let's use set notation to write out the sample space. For our first roll, we could roll a 1. And on the second roll, we have the option of rolling a 1, a 2, all the way up to a 6. The other possible outcome is that we could have rolled a 2 on our first roll. And then on the second roll, you could roll a 1, a 2, all the way up to a 6. So if you repeat this pattern, your first option is that you could roll a 6, and then your second roll you could roll a 1, all the way up to rolling a 6 on the first roll and a 6 on the second roll. This is a matrix format way of representing the sample space. One of the things to keep in mind is it says set notation, so to make this a set, we need to put braces on it. So what is the probability that 2 die sum to 5? Well, let's go through our sample space and locate all the places where you could have a sum of 5. The possibilities are that you get a 1 and a 4, or maybe a 4 and a 1, or you could get a 2 and a 3, or maybe a 3 and a 2. So in our sample space, what we're seeing is that there's four locations where this can happen. And if you want to know how many possible outcomes there were total, well, this matrix is 6 across and 6 down. That's a total of 6 times 6, or 36 observations. So our final probability is a 1 in 9 chance. What is the probability that the 2 die sum to 14? If you're looking at the die, summing to 14 is not possible. The largest sum that could happen would be 6 plus 6, or 12. So a sum of 14 cannot occur. We call this the null set, an impossible event. And the probability of an impossible event is 0. So this occurs with probability 0. Some common properties of probabilities are that it's always a number between 0 and 1. This means when you're answering a question, if you get back a negative number or a number bigger than 1, you need to recheck your work. The sum of all outcomes must add to 1 or 100%. An event equals zero if it never occurs. This is also the probability of the null set. Remember the probability of the null set equals zero. The, event, the probability of an event equals one if the event always occurs. The probability that the sun rises is one. The sun always rises. And generally, if your answer comes back as being smaller than 0.05, you could consider the event unusual or unlikely. For example, an automatic transmission can make noises such as whining, whirring, or grinding. The most common possible causes are a clogged filter, a defective pump, a defective torque converter, or defective gears. We will define the four events A, B, and C as in the table. What is the probability that the noise in the transmission is due to defective gears? We'll use the rule that says probabilities must sum to 1. The probability of A plus the probability of B plus the probability of C plus the probability of D must all add up to 1. If I plug in the values that are known, the probability of a clogged filter is 0.4. The probability of a defective pump is 0.3. The probability of a defective torque converter is 0.1. And the probability of defective gears will solve for. So subtract 0.4, subtract 0.3, and subtract 0.1 to the left-hand side of the equation. This will give back 0.2. To check if something is a legitimate probability distribution, you must first check that the value sum to 1. In our distribution, if we add these values up, they do sum to 1. The second thing you must check is that the probabilities are all between 0 and 1. Looking at the values in our table, they are all positive, meaning they're bigger than 0, and they're all less than 1. So we've met the second condition as well. 
Therefore, this is a legitimate probability distribution. The stem and leaf plot below shows the number of DVDs owned by a sample of 14 homes. If a home is selected at random, find the probability that the home owns more than 54 DVDs. To solve this, we'll need to find the number of homes that have more than 54 DVDs, and then we'll need to find the total number of homes. The problem told us 14 homes were sampled. If you count the number of items in the stem and leaf plot, there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and if you keep counting, when you hit here, you'll come up with a total of 14. To locate more than 54 D DVD players, let's think, picture how 54 would look on the stem and leaf plot. 5 would be the stem and 4 would be the leaf, so we're looking for a stem of 5 and numbers bigger than 4, which would be right here. So the numbers 55, 57, and 59. There's three homes that have more than 54 DVD players. So the probability of this event is 3 out of 14. As a decimal, this is 0.2. If our decimal is less than 0 0.05, it's considered an unusual event. If it's greater than 0.5, then it's not unusual. Here, to answer the question, would this be considered an unusual event, we will say no, because 0.2 is bigger than 0.05. This is a likely event. The complement rule is used when you know the probability that an event does occur, and you're interested in the probability that it does not occur. Notationally, this is the probability of a complement. Visually, if this is your sample space, and this is A within your sample space, everything not in A is A complement. Another way this diagram can be shown is if this is event A, everything not in this event is A complement. If I'm picturing the entire sample space and I want to know what the complement of it is, well, the complement of everything is nothing. So, Everything that does exist, the complement of that is everything that does not exist, which would be the null set. So the complement of your sample space is the null set. Let's use this diagram to derive at a formula. If we take the probability of A and add on the probability of A complement, this composes the entire sample space, meaning they occurs with probability 1. Go through and solve this for the probability of A complement, and you'll see that it's 1 minus the probability of A. This is the formula that we will be using, and this is called complement rule. If you want this formula in terms of words, the probability an event does not occur equals 1 minus the probability that the event does occur. Dally roping is a style of roping in which the roper throws a half hitch of rope around the saddle horn after a catch is made. The loose end of the rope is held in the roper's hands so he or she can shorten it or let it slip in case of an emergency. Sometimes when dallying, a cowboy or cowgirl will lose a finger because it gets caught between the rope and the saddle horn. The following table summarizes observations made on 256 ropers. This is our total sample size, and if you look in the table, the total is represented right here. Find the probability that a roper randomly chosen from this sample has undamaged fingers. In terms of notation, we're looking for the probability of undamaged fingers, the probability of U. The number of people with undamaged fingers are 66 headers plus 88 healers for a total of 154 ropers with undamaged fingers out of 256 ropers total. This is 0.39. Find the probability that a roper randomly chosen from the sample is not a healer. In terms of notation, the probability of being a healer would be L complement. And this is 1 minus the probability that someone is a healer. To get the probability that someone is a healer, we look at the 88 healers with undamaged fingers, plus the 44 with damaged fingers, plus the 23 missing one or more fingers. That makes a total of 155 healers out of 256 ropers. This is 0.39. There's a second way to work out this problem. If someone is not a healer, that means that they're a header. So you could have also seen this as the probability of being a header, which is 101 out of 256, or again, 0.39. Find the probability that a roper randomly chosen from the sample has undamaged fingers. Undamaged fingers is you. And is a header. 
header is H. Well, there are 66 headers with undamaged fingers out of a total of 256 ropers. This is 0.26. These are the works cited for this lecture.